You are listening to The Loop Podcast, a project in plastic surgery innovation. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident-guided in-service review of core surgical principles. I have with me here today Dr. Brian Masiri-Tarani. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. So let's keep in mind, this is a random smattering of topics and information, and there is a ton here. We are going to touch on electrolytes, nutrition, perioperative factors, wounds, head and neck surgery, cardiology, ventilation, trauma, vascular transplant, transgender, pregnancy, medications, practice management, ethics, and statistics. That's, that's a doozy. <laughs> that's a lot. Now, this isn't a comprehensive overview of all of them, obviously, but there's some very high yield uh, topics that we're going to cover leading up to the test. Uh, consider this a potpourri of pearls, if you will. Uh, I also urge everyone to check our YouTube channel as we will have visual supplements to this episode and as always, uh, evidence-based citations. Yeah, great. I love it. Okay, let's get started with electrolytes. So hypocalcemia causes perioral numbness and tingling. This can be seen with parathyroidectomy, which can happen with a major resection by ENT accidentally or with thyroidectomy. So hypernatremia the symptoms of this are nausea, vomiting, and confusion. Hyperkalemia can be seen after succinyl cooling administration and may result in paraplegics or any patients with upper or lower motor neuron injuries, severe burns, crush injuries, or conditions that cause rhabdo. This is characterized by spiked T waves on the EKG. The treatment is first to give IV calcium, whether it's IV calcium gluconate or IV calcium chloride. And the purpose of this is to stabilize the cardiac membranes. Then you're going to eventually give sodium bicarbonate and glucose combined with IV insulin. And that's to shift the potassium inside the cell intracellularly. Great. So let's talk about free water deficit. So this is the amount of free water required to bring the sodium concentration back to normal. If there is a deficit, there will be hypernatremia. This can occur with closed head injury and DI or diabetes insipidus. So the formula for this is the water deficit equals normal body water times one minus the serum sodium over 140. So that is normal body water is equal to the patient's weight in kilograms and then times 0.6 for men or 0.5 for women. So the one way to think about this is the question can give you a sodium either higher or lower than 140 and just know that if it's higher than 140, that's hypernatremia and there is some water deficit and this is how you calculate it. So the water deficit is equal to the normal body water, which is weight in kilograms times 0.5 if it's a woman or 0.6 if it's a man times 1 minus the serum sodium over 140. Let's move on to nutrition. So really for this, they always ask a question about respiratory quotient. And this is calculated as the VCO2, or that is the carbon dioxide produced, over the amount of oxygen consumed, which is VO2. So you really just have to memorize the respiratory quotient numbers. So a normal respiratory quotient is around 0.8. And if the patient is oxidizing fat, the respiratory quotient is low at 0.7. If they are oxidizing protein, it's 0.8. If they are oxidizing more carbohydrates, it's at 1.0. And if they are being overfed, they are making fat or lipogenesis, the respiratory quotient is 1.3. So remember that high at 1.3, you're overfeeding and making fat. Low is you are burning fat at 0.7. Nice. So let's move on to a couple of vitamins that are always uh, seem to be tested. So vitamin A, that always helps with wound healing in the setting of steroid use. Vitamin C is also helpful for wound healing, and it's necessary for cross-linking for collagen. So let's talk about some perioperative factors. Prothrombotic factors that should be considered include factor V Leiden mutation, perioperative tamoxifen therapy, 
and also antithrombin-3 deficiency. An important note for antithrombin-3 deficiency is that if you give patients heparin, the heparin that you're giving to them is worthless because the heparin works by augmenting the actions of antithrombin-3. So you must consider a different medication with a different mechanism of action. So perhaps like a direct thrombin inhibitor. Another syndrome to consider is antiphospholipid syndrome. In terms of DVT and PE, BMI greater than 25 and age greater than 40 are independent predictors of VTE risk. It's important to consider using the Caprini 2005 risk assessment model to risk stratify your patients. This is a validated tool that stratifies your patients based on several risk factors, and it's a series of questions. It's a free operative checklist in most hospitals and ambulatory centers. In terms of C. diff, that's usually secondary to antibiotic use. It can be mild or, or moderate or severe. If it's mild or moderate, the first-line therapy is flagyl. For patients that are intolerant to PO, you can give IV flagyl or PR vancomycin or perstoma. All right, let's talk about renal failure and acute kidney injury. So the fractional excretion of sodium, or FENA, compares the differences of sodium and creatinine in the plasma and urine. So this equation is hard to remember, so just memorize excreted over filtered for sodium. So that's FENA is equal to the sodium in the urine times the creatinine plasma over the sodium in the plasma times creatinine urine. So again, memorize excreted over filtered for sodium. So excreted sodium over plasma sodium, and then it's the opposite for creatinine. So multiply that times plasma creatinine over creatinine in the urine. So with pre-renal acute kidney injury, the FENA is less than 1%. If there is an intrinsic kidney injury, the FENA is greater than 1%. And that can be things such as ATN. In post-renal, the FENA is also greater than 1%, and that would be a urinary obstruction such as something distal to the kidney. AKI can be a common post-op problem. Expansion of intravascular volume with isotonic crystalloids is the mainstay of treatment. You do not want to use colloids. You also do not want to use diuretics, and you need to avoid using dopamine. The most important thing is intravascular restoration with isotonic crystalloids. Blood glucose control with level not higher than 180 is recommended by the surviving sepsis guidelines. It's also important to note that you do not have to restrict protein intake and you can stay around one gram per kilogram a day for non-catabolic patients. Let's move on to post-op delirium, which is something we've probably seen a lot in gen surge in our days. But delirium can manifest with hyperactive signs like agitation, restlessness, or it can show up as hypoactive signs like lethargy or inattentiveness. So it's important to differentiate the two and know that it can happen in either state. It's important to avoid benzos and antihistamines because both can exacerbate those symptoms. Now let's talk about post-op nausea and vomiting because this is a significant issue. So risk factors, it is increased in females, patients who do not smoke, which is interesting, so non-smoking status, patients with a history of post-operative nausea and vomiting or motion sickness, and age less than 50 years old. Also, things that happen with the anesthesia team, so use of post-operative or intraoperative opioids, inhalational anesthetics, and nitrous oxide. Another thing to increase your nausea and vomiting is a long surgery duration, and general surgery would be higher than a renal anesthesia. So next, let's talk about patient positioning. So patients in lithotomy, so it's important to prevent peroneal nerve compression, and you must use a heel support to prevent this nerve injury. If the patient is supine, then arms that are abducted or abducted no more than 90 degrees to prevent that brachial plexus injury. If you have the arms tucked, they should be in neutral position, and prone patients should have also a neck neutral position. So in general, neck needs to be neutral. All right, moving on to OR fires. There's three things that are needed for an OR fire. 
So first you need a fuel, an oxidizer, and an ignition source. So the fuel can be the alcohol prep, the oxidizer is the airway, oxygen, and lastly the ignition source can be the electrical cautery. So the first thing you want to do if there is an airway fire is to immediately remove the ET tube. We touched on this back in the burn episode, so you can refer to that to get into the weeds if you want, but let's move on in the interest of time. All right, so let's talk about codes. So in the hospital, we have a rapid response team, and this team responds to patients with hypotension, rapid heart rate, respiratory distress, and altered consciousness. That is in contrast to a code team who responds to cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, and airway obstruction. You also need to know about the ACLS protocol. So just know that current guidelines state that with CPR, it's 30 to 2 compression to ventilation rate with emphasis on high quality chest compressions. So of course, you're going to check a rhythm. You're going to hook them up to the monitor. So after shock, if indicated based on the rhythm, you must immediately restart compressions for two minutes and then recheck the rhythm. You should focus on chest compressions and not necessarily worry about airway in this scenario specific to ACLS. Now, this is very different from a TLS, which we'll get to in a minute. Let's touch on IV contrast and Again, emphasizing that you need to give saline prior to contrast to decrease contrast-induced nephropathy. I think I touched on this on another episode, but sometimes they'll put uh, NAC or N-acetylcysteine as a choice, but that does not help with contrast-induced nephropathy. And the thought was that it's a free radical scavenger, but that has weak to little no data. So saline is your go-to. Let's talk about sepsis now. Sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ system dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. The surviving sepsis guidelines strongly recommend that administration of IV antibiotics be initiated as soon as possible after recognition and within one hour for both sepsis and septic shock. This is usually done after culturing the patient if the patient has not had any blood cultures or sputum cultures, and the initiating antibiotics is considered, quote, early goal-directed therapy. And the go-to lab for identifying sepsis is lactate, and values greater than two is considered to be indicative or suggestive of sepsis if the clinical picture is consistent with it. All right, let's talk about malignant hyperthermia. Hardly ever seen, but always tested. So this is an inherited myopathy, and it is autosomal dominant. Findings are tachycardia, rigidity, so like muscle rigidity, metabolic acidosis, hypercapnia, hyperphosphatemia, and fever. Treatment is to give dantrolene, and you're also going to discontinue the volatile agents and also succinylcholine because those are the agents that really induce this problem of malignant hyperthermia. And then, of course, supportive care for you know, all the things that are sending the patient to the ICU. All right, let's talk about wounds. So in radiated wounds, a principle that you should understand is the need for aggressive surgical excision of the entire zone of injury with replacement with well vascularized tissue from outside of that zone of injury. So whether that be a local, regional, or free flap for coverage. If you have a chronic wound, especially one that is ulcerated or one that pops up with a history of radiation or prior cancer, always think biopsy first. All right, we all know that smoking impairs wound healing. The chemicals are bad that you get from smoking, and they include nicotine, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen cyanide. Nicotine causes vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation. This leads to local tissue ischemia, which inhibits the normal wound healing process. Now, keep in mind, smoking has never been shown to kill flaps, so this is just for wound healing, not for free flaps. We also get a lot of calls about extravasation injuries. Indications for operation in an extravasation injury include full thickness skin necrosis, chronic ulceration, and persistent pain. All right, let's talk briefly about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So let's talk about the approved uses of hyperbaric oxygen because some of these are counterintuitive And frankly, I probably would have never used this, but for the purpose of the test, 
the indications are number one for air or gas embolism number two carbon monoxide poisoning number three clostridial myositis and myonecrosis or gas gangrene number four crush injury compartment syndrome and other acute traumatic ischemias five decompression sickness six arterial insufficiency seven severe anemia eight intracranial abscess nine necrotizing soft tissue infections 10 refractory osteomyelitis 11 delayed radiation injury soft tissue and bony necrosis 12 compromised grafts and flaps 13 acute thermal burn injury and 14 idiopathic sudden sensorineural hearing loss so that's a lot and the reason i say that just look over this for the test is because uh, this has been a question in the past and unfortunately i haven't ever worked at a center which actually had a hyperbaric oxygen chamber that you would be willing to take a patient to that had something such as compartment syndrome or uh, necrotizing soft tissue infection, but it is an indication. All right, so the definition of surgical site infection, and th this is an infection that incurs within 30 days of surgery or one year of prosthesis implantation. So let's move on to some cardiology. Heart block and cardiac dysrhythmias are very common, so let's start with heart block. When the PR interval is prolonged, the patient has first degree AV block. When there's progressive lengthening of the PR interval, this is second degree AV block and is sometimes called winky block. AFib is very common. You will see a normal complex tachycardia without P waves with an irregularly irregular rhythm. A flutter can be seen with atrial enlargement and this has a characteristic sawtooth flutter wave on the EKG. Cardiac tamponade, uh, you will see what's known as Beck's triad. This is sinus tachycardia, elevated jugular venous pressure, and hypotension. Physical exam, you'll have muffled heart sounds and a friction rub. So the first thing you want to do is bust out your handy stethoscope that you have carrying around with you all the time and auscultate the chest. And then if you're feeling really dangerous, uh, you're going to want to do a drainage with either needle decompression or pericardial window which thank God I do not have to describe anymore. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, that's definitely on the general surgery boards though. All right, so let's talk about ventilation. Take a look at the diagram on YouTube to visualize all of these because these are a little bit hard to visualize in your head. So first, tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air or gas displaced with one normal breath. Inspiratory capacity is the total volume of air that enters the lung during the most forcible inspiration. Inspiratory reserve volume equals the inspiratory capacity minus the tidal volume. The residual volume is the volume of air still remaining in the lungs after a forced expiration. So the volume that you can't exhale, the volume that's left in the lungs when you blow everything out. Functional residual capacity is what is left when you take a normal breath. So you breathe out normally without any force, and what is left in your lungs is the functional residual capacity. The total lung capacity, this is literally the total lung volume, all the volume that the lung can hold. Vital capacity is the total volume you can inhale plus exhale, excluding that residual volume. So you take the deepest breath possible and then exhale as much as possible. That is the vital capacity because all that is left is what you cannot exhale, which is the residual volume. So more definitions. Minute ventilation is the respiratory rate times the tidal volume. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about head and neck surgery. Let's start with lymph node levels. So level one is the submental area. The lateral compartments include levels two to five, and keep in mind levels two to four are anterior to the SCM and level five is posterior to the SCM. Level two is the upper portion, anterior to the SCM. Level three is mid jugular, level four is inferior jugular. Whereas, like I said before, level five is posterior to the SCM. Level six is the central compartment, and this is what we take with thyroid cancer. And level seven is the mediastinum. 
All right, for neck dissection. So a modified radical neck dissection is indicated in T1 or T2 head and neck cancers and has shown to have increased survival when performed electively. And this would be in a clinically node negative patient. So modified radical means you're taking levels one through five. A radical neck dissection is indicated for involvement of nerve vein or muscle. And so therefore this also removes the submandibular gland, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the jugular vein, and the spinal accessory nerve. Neck dissection adds increased complications. As you can imagine, you're doing way more surgery, but it does decrease nodal recurrence. Iatrogenic chyolic can occur after neck dissections due to thoracic duct injury. You can confirm this by testing the drain for triglyceride levels. If there is a chyolic, there will be greater triglyceride levels in the drain than in the serum. Alternatively, if the triglyceride level in the drain is greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter or has the presence of chyl microns, this is also indicative of a chyl leak. The first line treatment is dietary modification to low fat plus octreotide therapy. Infection risk in mandible fractures are commonly tested and it's important to note that smokers have the highest risk of infection. Additionally, there's increased risk in older men, and there's also an increased infection risk the greater number of fractures there are to the mandible. So for example, if you have two, three, or four fractures in the mandible, that's gonna confer a higher infection risk if you only have, say, an isolated fracture on one side of the mandible. There's also a greater infection risk if you use intraoral incisions or have a combined approach using intraoral and extraoral incisions versus extraoral incision alone. The mouth is a dirty, dirty place, as we all know. <laughs> a dirty, dirty place. I love it. <laughs> all right, let's move on to vascular. If there's a question about peripheral blood flow, and I mean from a chronic standpoint, i.e. non-palpable pulses, the first in line for workup is ABI, or ankle brachial index. So the ankle brachial index less than or equal to 0.9 establishes the presence of peripheral artery disease, between 0.5 and 0.79 yields wound healing issues, and less than 0.5 is critical limb ischemia and results in rest pain and arterial insufficiency. Acute arterial thrombotic occlusion of an extremity, so this would be acute, not chronic. First, the patient gets aspirin and heparin to prevent propagation of the clot, and then operative intervention with either thrombectomy or endovascular catheter-directed thrombolysis. Let's move on to trauma. And we'll start by going over some uh, basics like ATLS. And we all know our ABCs, always be closing. Just kidding. <laughs> Airway breathing circulation. So that's the key to many, many questions. And it's not going to be too complicated. But for example, a burn patient with singed nose hairs or facial burns, the first thing you want to do is secure the airway. So you're going to intubate the patient. No matter what's going on with the trauma patient, including a burn, make sure to do your ABCs. After the primary survey is your secondary survey, then you're gonna do labs and pertinent imaging. And don't forget to do fetal monitoring for pregnant patients and the RH status. All right, so when you have a bleeding patient, massive transfusion protocol is transfusing fresh frozen plasma or FFP and packed red blood cells at a one-to-one -one ratio and discontinuing IV crystalloids. So you wanna do just red blood cells and FFP at one-to-one, -one, no crystalloids. So tension pneumothorax on physical exam will have tachypnea, dyspnea, jugular venous distension, decreased air entry, hyperresonance on the affected side, tracheal deviation to the opposite side, and hypotension. Treatment is immediate decompression of the pleural space with a large bore needle followed by insertion of a chest tube. If there is any chance the patient has a pneumothorax and has these findings, you go straight to needle decompression. And any chance means maybe the patient just had a breast augmentation or just had rib cartilage harvested. So that will be a common scenario. You have just done that surgery. Patient starts having these physical exam findings. You go straight to needle decompression. Nice. Moving on to different neck zones. And keep in mind, uh, I talked about lymph node zones in the neck that's different than trauma neck zones 
So try not to uh, trip those up. So zone one extends from the sternal notch or the clavicles to the cricoid cartilage and includes thoracic outlet vasculature, the proximal carotid arteries, vertebral arteries, the APCs of the lungs, trachea, esophagus, spinal cord, thoracic duct, and the thyroid gland. Zone two, going cranially, continues cephalad from the cricocartilage to the angle of the mandible and contains the common carotid arteries, internal and external branches of the carotid arteries, vertebral arteries, jugular veins, trachea, esophagus, larynx and pharynx, spinal cord, vagus, and recurrent laryngeal nerves. And continuing upwards is zone three, and that covers the region above the angle of the mandible up to the base of the skull and contains the cranial portion of the internal carotid arteries. Also includes the vertebral arteries, jugular veins, pharynx, spinal cord, cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12, and the sympathetic chain. Now keep in mind, penetrating zone 2 neck traumas need to be explored in the operating room, whereas zones 1 and 3, if they're stable, you do a physical exam and proceed for a CTA to see if there's any major arterial or vascular injuries. The most common injured structure with penetrating injury is the major arteries and veins. So that's why that CTA is important if they're stable. All right, let's talk about crush injuries. So we talked about compartment syndrome in the lower extremity lectures, but let's talk a little bit more about physiology. So the injured muscle cells will release potassium. So you will therefore see hyperkalemia. These cells will also absorb calcium, which means systemically you will see hypocalcemia. Systemically, you will also see shock, metabolic acidosis, and renal failure. And of course, compartment syndrome of the extremity. Let's move on to head injuries. So you could see patients with neurogenic or central diabetes insipidus. This is caused by lack of vasopressin, aka antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. This is usually produced by the hypothalamus and released by the posterior pituitary gland. ADH usually causes fluid retention at the collecting ducts and distal convoluted tubule. Without it, you will see dilute urine and hypernatremia. For patients with signs of symptomatic progressive intracranial pressure following head traumas, there's a few maneuvers that you could do to help with treatment. This includes hypertonic saline, which is 3% saline, hyperventilation, mannitol, diuretics, raising the head of the bed to be elevated, and surgical decompression. All right, let's move on to transplantation. So rejection can be hyperacute, accelerated, acute, and chronic. Hyperacute is a humoral response mediated by antibodies that are already present in the host at the time of transplantation. So this starts in the OR immediately. Rapid ischemic failure, usually within the first few minutes to hours of graft reperfusion. So next, accelerated rejection. So this is a cellular and humoral response. Memory cells mediate a rapid immune response against the graft. Next is acute. So this is regulated by the activation of T cells. And this is most common within the first four to six months. There is organ dysfunction and a graft biopsy is needed. So then chronic, this is antibody and cell mediated immune response that causes indolent progressive arterial sclerosis and fibrosis of the transplanted organ. This can occur months to years after transplantation. It will progress to graft failure. We also have graft versus host disease. This is a cellular response caused by activation of the transplanted graft's immune cells by the recipient's tissues. All right, let's move on to infections in the transplanted patient. So CMV or cytomegalovirus is the most common infection in these transplant patients. All patients receive prophylaxis for this. Face transplant is unique with oral and sinus cavities. And so candida is the most ubiquitous and most common flora and that usually presents as white plaques. Treatment is topical nystatin and clotrimidazole. Shout out to the entire NYU face transplant team for performing the first ever face and bilateral hand transplant that was recently yeah. done. It's just absolutely incredible. Let's move on to the donation 
criteria. So you must have consent, obviously, that goes without saying. While HIV status used to be a contraindication, it no longer is currently. For donation, brain death must be established, and this includes an absence of all brainstem reflexes, and this includes the absence of the corneal and pupillary reflex. There are some other maneuvers that you can do to determine if the brainstem is intact. So for example, nystagmus during cold caloric testing can demonstrate an intact brainstem. Cough or gag during tracheal manipulation demonstrates the presence of the cough reflex and therefore the brainstem reflex. Any respiratory rate during an apnea test is also a sign of brainstem function. Keep in mind that deep tendon reflexes are not part of assessing brain death, so don't let that fool you. This is a spinal cord reflex, not a brainstem reflex. Another very important thing to remember is that the patient must be normothermic. This means that if the patient is hypothermic, you cannot deem someone brain dead, even if they have all of the other requisite testing done. So keep in mind, if they have all the things that we talked about that would determine brain death, if they're hypothermic, you can't really consider that as brain death. And lastly, for immunosuppressants, uh, calcineurin inhibitors are nephrotoxic, and it's very common to see a rise in creatinine. So the first thing you're going to do if you see a rise in creatinine and a patient's on a calcineurin inhibitor is to lower the trough levels of the drug. All right, let's talk about pregnant patients. So the most recent guidelines for non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Committee on Obstetric Practice, that was 2011, recommend performing non-urgent surgery in the second trimester to minimize the risk of preterm contractions and spontaneous abortion. So that is second trimester. So this means if possible, if you have, say, a cancer, you must excise the cancer under local and this would be an example of melanoma. And you can later perform the sentinel node in the second trimester. Make sure and do the lymphocytography prior to resection, because this is important before you do the surgical resection of the cancer. So for breast cancer, you want to give, if possible, neoadjuvant therapy and perform a mastectomy. You could perform a lumpectomy plus radiation if you can push to the third trimester, and then you're going to do the radiation after delivery. Remember, a gravid uterus can obstruct the vena cava. So in ATLS, you have airway, breathing, circulation. Part of circulation is turning the patient on their left side to take the pressure off the vena cava. Remember this as it's usually the answer for the next thing to do in ATLS. Also remember the number one cause of fetal death is maternal hypotension and maternal death, so treat the mother first. Next. If it's a viable pregnancy, start thinking around 24 weeks. You need to monitor the fetus, but this is after you stabilize the mother. Let's go on to lactation. Patients that present with large swollen breasts may present with a galactoseal. So if it is a galactoseal, you're going to percutaneously drain it. If the patient has stopped breastfeeding, give bromocryptine, which is a prolactin inhibitor. If the galactoseal is infected, you may have to place the patient on antibiotics for skin flora coverage. All right, let's talk about transgender surgery. So the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, have established guidelines that necessitate that medical necessity be met prior to surgery, and the criteria include, number one, the capacity of the patient to make a fully informed decision and provide consent. So patients who are younger than 18 may provide assent along with parental consent for a mastectomy. Number two, there must be at least 12 months of hormone therapy consistent with the individual's gender goals. Number three, they must be living life fully in the role of the desired sex for at least 12 months. Number four, all psychiatric illnesses must be stable and controlled. And number five, there must be documentation of gender dysphoria and the potential benefit from surgery by at least two healthcare providers. All right, great. Let's talk about some medications and some anesthetic techniques. Let's start with the tap block. Tap block is used to help with post-op pain in the abdomen, and you can use ultrasound guidance to inject exactly where you want it to go. The intercostal nerves provide sensation to the anterior abdominal wall from T6 to L1, 
and this is located in the plane between the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscles. This is extremely high yield for the test and also clinically practical to remember to optimize your pain control for your patients and oftentimes done during deep flaps, abdominal plasties, etc. All right, so another block, the infraorbital nerve block. So this blocks the ipsilateral central and lateral incisor, the canine, and both bicuspid teeth or premolars. So let's talk about meds we will commonly use in conscious sedation. So first, fentanyl. So this is a narcotic, so they will need Narcan or Naloxone for reversal. Versed or Midazolam, you can give Flumazenil. I always remember this by Fluma or Fuma, like smoke in Spanish, so breathe in deep. So too high on benzos, you get respiratory depression. <laughs> That's how I always remember Flumazenil. All right, lidocaine. So the maximum dose of lidocaine without epinephrine is 4.5 milligrams per kilogram, and with epinephrine is 7 milligrams per kilogram. So with toxicity, you will have circumoral tongue numbness, metallic taste, lightheadedness, dizziness, visual and auditory disturbances, disorientation, and drowsiness. At higher doses, you will also see muscle twitching, convulsions, unconsciousness, coma, respiratory depression, and arrest, cardiovascular depression, and collapse. And the treatment for this is IV fat emulsion. First line of treatment for patients with anaphylaxis is epinephrine. It's always epinephrine. If they mention something about an allergic reaction and the patient is having some airway swelling, lips, throat, answer is epinephrine, don't waste your time with steroids, Benadryl, all that stuff. If you're using epinephrine locally for vasoconstriction, however, the reversal agent is fentolamine, which is an alpha adrenergic receptor blocker. All right, so a brief mention on antibiotic use. So for implant reconstruction, recommendation is the first dose 30 minutes prior to skin incision and then for 24 hours post-op. Another testable thing they may ask is Redman syndrome. This is a rash and pruritus from medication such as usually vancomycin infusion. And the treatment is to give an antihistamine, but then you can actually resume the infusion at a slower rate after you give the antihistamine. Let's move on to anticoagulation. Rifaroxaban or Xeralto blocks factor 10A and that helps convert prothrombin to thrombin. Coumadin inhibits the vitamin K dependent factors, which include factors 2, factor 7, factor 9, and factor 10. Heparin prevents clot propagation by blocking thrombin mediated activation of fibrinogen to fibrin. And so that's done by antithrombin 3. And so again, heparin augments antithrombin 3. Aspirin inhibits platelet function. So keep in mind there is no risk of continuing aspirin throughout surgery, so there's no increased risk of hematoma in minor surgery. Another thing to mention, to reduce intraoperative bleeding, so transexamic acid or TXA, so this inhibits the proteolytic action of plasmin, thus inhibiting fibrinolysis, and it has been shown in multiple studies to reduce both intraoperative and postoperative blood loss, and this is actually frequently used in craniosynostosis. Let's talk about patient management. So breast reconstruction disparities, patients who live farther away from providers of reconstruction and those who are uninsured or with Medicaid have much lower incidence of reconstruction compared with those who have insurance or who live close to a provider who performs breast reconstruction. There's always a question on caretaker neglect. So whether it's a child or an adult or an elder, you must report abuse even if the patient denies abuse and you suspect it. For healthcare workers and needle stick injuries, for HCV needle stick injuries, testing for anti-HCV antibodies and confirmatory immunoassays for HCV RNA should be done immediately and repeated at six weeks, three months, and six months. Let's briefly mention practice management. So the global surgical package is a single payment for all care associated with a surgical procedure. So after surgery, there is a 90-day global period where you cannot bill for routine post-operative care. So this includes basically everything except returning to the operating room for a complication. You can bill for that, but not unless you're actually in the main OR. 
So if you do this in a small surgery room or in your office, you cannot bill for that only if you go back to the OR. As a business and a public space, a doctor's office must be in compliance with the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act. Services cannot be denied to patients with a disability because of the disability if services could otherwise be provided. Accommodations should be made to examine the patient with a disability as any other patient. And the office must provide this without expense to the patient. Let's talk about stats briefly. So the null hypothesis states that there is no difference between two groups. So think about you set out in your research project to find a difference that you previously did not know existed. You seek out the ability to reject the null hypothesis. So a type 1 error is the error of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. A type 2 error is the error of not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually false. So a type 2 error can be seen when there is not enough power to study, so not enough patients to see a difference. Sensitivity, please look at the YouTube channel. This will make it way more easy if you can look at this box. But just remember that sensitivity is equal to A over A plus C. And what that means is sensitivity is the true positive divided by all those with disease present. Or in other words, the true positive plus the false negatives. Specificity, on other hand, is D over B plus D, and that is specificity is true negatives divided by all those without the disease, or in other words, the false positive plus the true negative. Sometimes this is hard for me to remember, so I just like to draw the box whenever I first get on the test before I even read the whole question, or else it will just confuse me. So if you can memorize that box, you can draw it out and usually get all these questions correct. The p-value, or calculated probability, is the probability of finding the observed results when the null hypothesis of a study question is true. So the smaller the p-value, the more likely the observed difference is not due to sampling error. So let's move on to evidence rating scales for studies. Level 1 is the highest quality studies, and this includes multi-centered or single-centered RCTs with good power or systematic reviews of these studies. Level 2 includes lesser quality RCTs with smaller power or prospective cohorts or comparative studies. Level 3 includes retrospective cohorts or case control studies or systematic review of these studies. Level four includes case series, and level five includes expert opinion with uh, case studies. All right, let's talk about ethics really quick. So terms and definitions, beneficence, this means the doing of good. Maleficence, inequity, and noxiousness are all associated with doing harm. Justice is the principle requiring doctors to ensure that medical care is available to all. Let's talk about HIPAA because there's always seemed to be at least one question of HIPAA. So make sure to send patient info via encrypted routes such as email. ASPS has a code of ethics. You can participate in charitable events such as giveaways, but make sure you're not giving away procedures that require an incision. So for example, Botox is okay, but anything that requires a cut is not. So you can't just raffle off a free facelift. Okay, everyone, that was a fast overview of what you are likely to see on the in-service exam related to the core principles section. So thanks, Brian, for joining me today. I know that was a ton of information, but it was super high yield. So hopefully everyone will get a lot of benefit out of listening to this. Thank you. And if you like our podcast, please spread the word, tell a friend, like us on Facebook, watch this on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast to get in the loop.